In the shadows of time and faith, a name emerges that has marked history like no other. Jesus of Nazareth. His life, message, and legacy have transformed civilizations, divided empires, and renewed souls. But after centuries of stories, interpretations, and controversies, what do we really know about him? Was he really born on December 25th, as many people have claimed over the centuries? Was he a direct creation of God, as some maintain? In this documentary, we will unravel 15 myths and lies that have been woven around the figure of Jesus, from claims that challenge the essence of his divinity to fabricated narratives that attempt to obscure his mission on Earth. Before we continue, tell us what country you are watching from and what you think about this topic. Let's get started. Over the centuries, multiple erroneous beliefs have constructed an image of Jesus that, although popular, distances itself from the biblical testimony and its authentic message. Many of these misconceptions arise from cultural misunderstandings, human traditions that have developed over time, or attempts to merge its teachings with other ideologies, as well as from secular interpretations that distort Christianity. By exploring and correcting these ideas, we discover the relevance and transformative impact of Jesus' original message. Understood in its purity, this message reveals to us a divine love, a spiritual authority, and a mission that transcends human limitations. Our purpose is to rescue that truth and correct the distortions that have diverted the perception of its nature and mission. Let us embark on this journey to uncover misconceptions about Jesus in the light of Scripture and come closer to the truth of his identity and purpose. Number 1. Jesus was born on December 25th. One of the most widespread beliefs in Christian tradition is that Jesus was born on December 25th. However, this fact is not found in the Gospels or in any other biblical writing. The date of December 25th was established several centuries after the events narrated in the Bible, probably in order to replace pagan celebrations that coincided with the winter solstice, such as the Roman festivals of Saturnalia, or the celebrations dedicated to Saul Invictus, unconquered sun, the god of the sun. Historically, the establishment of this date has no solid biblical basis. However, a detailed analysis of the scriptures clearly indicates that it is unlikely that Christ was born on December 25th. Next, we present two key reasons that support this conclusion. First of all, according to Luke chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, we know that during the time Jesus was born, shepherds were out in the fields watching over their flocks at night. However, in Judea, shepherds did not do this in the month of December due to the lack of fodder and bad weather. Luke's account suggests that Jesus may have been born in the summer or early fall. Because December in Judea is cold and rainy, shepherds would surely have sought shelter for their flocks at night. In second place, Jesus' parents went to Bethlehem to be registered in a Roman census. The Romans would not have ordered a census during the height of winter, when temperatures often dropped below freezing and roads were in poor condition for travel. Taking a census in such conditions would have been a failure. So if Jesus was not born on December 25th, is there anything in the Bible that tells us when he was born? The biblical account points to autumn in the Northern Hemisphere as the most likely time for Jesus' birth based on details surrounding the conception and birth of John the Baptist. Because Elizabeth, John's mother, was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Jesus was conceived, if we know when John was born, we can determine the approximate time of year that Jesus was born. Zechariah, John's father, was a priest and was serving in the temple in Jerusalem during Abijah's watch, as alluded to in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Historical calculations indicate that in that year, this tour of duty fell in June. During this period of service in the temple, Zechariah learned that he and his wife Elizabeth would have a son. After his service, he returned home and Elizabeth conceived. Assuming that John's conception took place in late June, if we add nine months, that brings us to the end of March as the most likely date of John's birth. Adding another six months, the age difference between John and Jesus, we arrive at the end of September as the probable date of Jesus' birth. Although it is difficult to determine when someone first celebrated December 25th as Christmas, historians generally agree that it happened sometime during the 4th century. This is an incredibly late date. Christmas was not celebrated in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, 
until almost 300 years after the death of Christ. Its origins cannot be traced back to either the teachings or the customs of the early Christians. Number two, Jesus is the Father. Some believe that Jesus and the Father are the same person, but this interpretation goes against the central teaching of the Trinity and is a form of heresy known as modalism. Modalism holds that God manifests himself in different modes or forms throughout history, such as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that they are not distinct persons, but rather manifestations of one God. This view denies the distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is incompatible with the biblical teaching on the nature of God. In contrast, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity affirms that the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons, but one God in essence. The Bible clearly shows that Jesus and the Father are distinct. In the Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus prays to the Father, asking Him to glorify Him, indicating that they are not the same person. Furthermore, in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus mentions that He will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit, highlighting the difference between the three divine persons. These and other passages reinforce the understanding that the three persons of the Trinity, although co-equal in essence, are distinct in person. The distinction between Jesus and the Father is crucial to understanding salvation. If Jesus were the Father, the sacrifice on the cross would lose its profound meaning, since there would be no true mediation between God and humanity. The doctrine of the Trinity, therefore, is essential to correctly understanding the nature of God and the redemptive work of Christ, and to rejecting interpretations such as modalism, which distort the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Number 3. Jesus Came to Abolish the Law some people think that with the coming of Jesus, the Old Testament law was abolished or no longer has relevance. This idea arises from a misinterpretation of Jesus' mission, suggesting that he came to undo the laws given to Israel in ancient times. However, this view overlooks Jesus' real purpose, which was not to do away with the law, but to give it its full fulfillment. The Old Testament law, which included moral, ceremonial, and civil rules, had a specific purpose, and far from being discarded, Jesus completed and fulfilled it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus makes this point clear when he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. With this, Jesus clarifies that his purpose was not to abolish the law, but to fulfill everything that was established in it. The laws and prophecies of the Old Testament pointed to him, and his life, death, and resurrection were the fulfillment of those promises. For example, the Old Testament sacrifices foreshadowed the perfect sacrifice Jesus would make for the sins of the world. Rather than abolishing the law, he fulfilled it completely. Furthermore, Jesus did not come to do away with the moral teachings of the law. On the contrary, he reaffirmed and deepened them. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus not only explained the law in terms of external actions, but he stressed that internal thoughts and attitudes are also important. For example, Jesus teaches that not only the act of murder is sin, but so is hatred in the heart. In short, we are not under the law, but in Christ, because the law finds its fulfillment in Him. Some think that by stating that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, the ceremonial laws and other aspects of the Old Testament are still in force, but this is not correct. Many avoid studying the Old Testament because they believe it has been completely abolished. But the reality is that the New Testament cannot be fully understood without understanding the Old. The Old Testament prepares the way for the coming of Christ and helps us understand the purpose of His redemptive work. Number 4. Jesus had a romantic relationship with Mary Magdalene. A popular theory, especially in books and movies like The Da Vinci Code, suggests that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a romantic relationship or were even married. However, there is no biblical evidence to support this idea. The Gospels never mention or suggest that Jesus had a romantic relationship with Mary Magdalene, but instead she is presented as a devoted disciple and faithful follower of Jesus. The Bible describes Mary Magdalene as a woman from whom Jesus cast out seven demons and a key witness to Christ's resurrection. These passages underscore her important role as a disciple 
but there is no indication that her relationship with Jesus was romantic in nature. Jesus treated his female followers with respect and included them in his ministry, but there is never a suggestion of a romantic connection. The theory of a romance between Jesus and Mary Magdalene has no basis in biblical texts or traditional Christian teaching. Jesus came to fulfill a divine mission of salvation and redemption, and his relationship with his female disciples was spiritual and educational, not romantic. The idea of a secret romance is modern speculation with no basis in scripture. Number five, Jesus was rich and lived in luxury. In some misinterpretations of Jesus' life, it has been claimed that he lived in abundance, surrounded by wealth and luxury. This view may have arisen from the idea that, as the Son of God, Jesus should have lived with all the power, prestige, and comfort that the world could offer. However, this view is completely contrary to what the Gospels teach us about the life of Jesus. The reality is that Jesus lived in an extremely humble manner, without attachment to riches or material pleasures, focusing on his spiritual mission of saving humanity. The refutation of this idea is found in several key teachings and passages of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus himself states, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This verse clearly shows that Jesus did not have a permanent residence or material possessions. Throughout his ministry, he lived as a nomad, homeless and dependent on the generosity of others. His followers, such as some women who accompanied him, provided him with sustenance, but he did not live in luxury or comfort, but rather adopted a life of poverty and humility. Furthermore, Jesus' teachings on wealth reinforce his focus on material detachment. On multiple occasions, Jesus spoke about the importance of renouncing wealth in order to follow him and live a life of service and sacrifice. Therefore, the image of a rich and well-off Jesus is a distortion of his true lifestyle, which was marked by simplicity, humility, and sacrifice. Number six, Jesus was just a prophet. Some people hold that Jesus was simply a prophet, a historical figure who came to teach and guide the people, comparable to other Old Testament prophets such as Moses or Isaiah. According to this view, Jesus would be just a wise man who spoke on behalf of God and offered moral teachings, but he would not have a divine identity or a unique role in human redemption. However, this understanding of Jesus is incomplete and does not reflect what he himself claimed about his identity. Jesus not only saw himself as a prophet, but presented himself as the Son of God with a unique and special relationship with the Father and the only path to the salvation of humanity. His mission was not only to transmit a divine message, but to fulfill a plan of redemption that only he could carry out. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This statement is not limited to the role of a prophet who simply points out the way, but Jesus presents himself as the source of truth and salvation, something that goes beyond any prophecy. Jesus not only speaks on behalf of God, but he himself is the way to the Father, the absolute truth and eternal life. This claim of exclusivity shows that Jesus did not consider himself just another prophet, but the center of God's revelation. Furthermore, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. These kinds of statements reveal Jesus' unique identity, something no prophet would have said. Jesus was not only a messenger of God, but he identified himself as one with God, which is a radical and fundamental statement of his divine nature. If Jesus were only a prophet, these words would be blasphemous. But for him, as the Son of God, they reflect the truth of his intimate relationship with the Father. Jesus did not come just to give a message, but to reveal himself as the incarnation of God the Son, fulfilling a central role in the divine plan of salvation for humanity. Number seven, Jesus was a political leader. Some people interpret Jesus as a political or revolutionary leader, believing that his mission was to free the Jews from Roman rule and establish an earthly kingdom. However, this idea distorts the true nature of his purpose. Although many expected the Messiah to bring political liberation, Jesus never presented himself as a leader who came to change the political order, but as someone whose mission was much deeper and more spiritual. In John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answers Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from hence. With this statement, Jesus makes it clear that his kingdom has nothing to do with political power or the fight against earthly governments. His message was not about establishing a state or a nation, but about transforming the human heart and offering salvation through reconciliation with God. The kingdom of Jesus is spiritual and manifests itself in those who accept his teachings and live according to the principles of love, forgiveness, and truth. Jesus' mission was ultimately saving and redemptive, not political. He came to preach the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of peace, justice, and eternal life, not an earthly kingdom. His focus was not on reforming political structures, but on restoring the relationship between God and humanity, offering forgiveness and hope to all who believe in him. Number eight, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Some people argue that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, suggesting that he avoided openly declaring himself as such during his lifetime. This idea is based on a misinterpretation of the Gospels, since in fact, Jesus did identify himself as the Messiah on several occasions. Although at times he preferred not to explicitly reveal his identity, this does not mean that he never did so. In fact, in John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, during his conversation with the Samaritan woman, she mentions that she is waiting for the Messiah, and Jesus responds, I am he who speaks to you. This is a direct statement that he is the Messiah, the Savior promised by God. In addition to this direct statement, Jesus also fulfilled Old Testament messianic prophecies, further reinforcing his identity as the Messiah. Throughout his ministry, Jesus' works and miracles also confirmed his identity as the Messiah. He healed the sick, raised the dead, he gave sight to the blind, and preached the gospel to the poor, thus fulfilling many of the Old Testament prophecies about what the Messiah would do. These acts not only demonstrated his divine power, but validated his claim as God's anointed one, the one who would bring salvation to the people of Israel and all of humanity. It is therefore incorrect to claim that Jesus never identified himself as the Messiah. Not only did he say so explicitly, as in his conversation with the Samaritan woman, but his life, his teachings, and his miracles confirmed that he was the fulfillment of the messianic promises. Jesus was not just a prophet or a teacher. He was the promised Messiah, the Savior who came to redeem humanity through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. Number 9. Jesus did not experience real suffering. Some people believe that because of his divinity, Jesus did not really suffer, as his divine nature was supposed to have protected him from human pain. However, this belief is incorrect. Jesus experienced genuine suffering, both physical and emotional, during his life, especially at his passion and crucifixion. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it states that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. This means that although he was divine, Jesus lived the full human experience, including suffering. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he faced deep emotional anguish, anticipating the sacrifice he was about to suffer. During his crucifixion, he endured extreme physical pain. Furthermore, on the cross, Jesus also experienced spiritual suffering as he felt momentarily separated from God, as indicated by his cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thus, Jesus not only experienced the physical pain of the cross, but also emotional anguish and spiritual separation. His suffering was real and complete, allowing him to fully identify with our own afflictions. Number 10. Jesus approved of violence in his name. Sometimes, some people justify violence in the name of Jesus, believing that he would support the use of force to defend his cause or impose his message. This misunderstanding has led to tragic interpretations throughout history, such as the Holy Inquisition, where violent and cruel methods, such as torture and executions, were used to purify heretics in the name of the Christian faith. However, this interpretation of Jesus is completely wrong, since he always taught about peace, love, and forgiveness. The refutation of this error is found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, when, after the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter draws his sword and cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Jesus severely rebukes him, saying, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword.
With this statement, Jesus flatly rejects violence as a means of advancing his kingdom. His message was not one of armed struggle, but of peace, love, and reconciliation. Throughout his life, Jesus preached love for enemies, forgiveness, and reconciliation, as seen in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, where he says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This teaching is clear. Violence has no place on the path of Jesus. The Holy Inquisition and other historical episodes of violence in the name of faith are a clear contrast to what Jesus taught. He never approved the use of force to impose faith, but urged his followers to seek peace, forgiveness, and inner transformation as the true way to advance his kingdom. Number 11. He was resurrected only spiritually, not physically. Some people hold that Jesus' resurrection was not a physical event, but rather a spiritual or symbolic experience. According to this interpretation, Jesus was resurrected in the sense that his spirit lived in the hearts of believers, but his body was not actually resurrected. However, this view contradicts the biblical accounts which clearly state that Jesus was resurrected in a real physical body. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 39 to 43, after his resurrection, Jesus shows himself to his disciples and tells them, Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Jesus not only shows them his wounds, but he eats with them, confirming that his resurrection was physical, not just spiritual. If it were only a spiritual phenomenon, it would make no sense for Jesus to offer tangible evidence of his resurrected body. Furthermore, in John chapter 20, verse 27, Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds so that he will stop doubting and believe. This reinforces the idea that Jesus' resurrection was physical, since he himself invited the disciples to interact with his resurrected body. The physical resurrection of Jesus is crucial to the Christian faith, as it validates his divinity and victory over death. As stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. The resurrection was not only a spiritual act, but a physical miracle that guarantees the hope of future resurrection for all believers. Number 12. Jesus is not coming back. Some people doubt the promise that Jesus will return, thinking that this return is a metaphor or a teaching irrelevant to modern Christianity. Often, this skepticism arises from the perception that many centuries have passed since Jesus' ascension without this promise being fulfilled. For some, the idea of a literal return of Jesus seems more like a mystical hope than a future reality. However, the biblical teaching on Christ's second coming is clear and emphatic, and this promise is a fundamental pillar of the Christian faith. The refutation of this error is found in several direct statements by Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 3, he himself says to his disciples, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This promise is not a figure of speech or an abstract idea. Jesus speaks with certainty about his physical and personal return. His return is the culmination of his redemptive work, and he presents it as a real future event, where he himself will take his followers to be with him in his heavenly home. The second coming of Christ is a central hope in the Christian faith. It is seen as the moment when Christ will complete his victory over evil, establish his eternal kingdom, and bring about divine justice. Therefore, the second coming of Christ is not only a promise of hope for the future, but an essential foundation for the Christian faith, which longs for the consummation of God's work in history. We want to clarify that we are talking about the visible second coming of Jesus, a physical and glorious return that everyone will see. Furthermore, the church also awaits the rapture, a prior event in which believers will be taken to heaven to meet Christ. 
as mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. However, the second coming will be a definitive and public event that will occur after the rapture. Number 13. Jesus did not perform miracles. Some people believe that Jesus' miracles were not real events, but should be interpreted as symbols or spiritual lessons. According to this view, healings, resurrections, and other miracles would not be literal acts, but rather metaphors to convey messages about Jesus' spiritual power. However, this interpretation minimizes the true meaning and importance of miracles in the life of Jesus. The refutation of this error is found in the Gospels, which clearly document Jesus' miracles as real events. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 to 5, Jesus himself points out the miracles he is performing as proof of his divine identity. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised. This shows that the miracles were concrete signs of his divine power, not just symbolic representations. The Gospels contain numerous accounts of miracles that Jesus performed in a tangible way, such as the healing of the leper or the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. These events are not mere illustrations, but divine interventions that transformed people's physical and spiritual reality. Each miracle highlights Jesus' power to change the natural course of things. Number 14. Jesus did not teach about hell. According to this idea, Jesus never spoke of hell clearly or directly, and what is known as eternal punishment was an addition made by the church in later times. This view, however, is not supported by the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, where he repeatedly spoke about hell and its terrible consequences. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, for example, Jesus warns, And do not fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Here, Jesus not only mentions hell, but also describes it as a place of eternal punishment, underscoring the importance of fearing God, who has the power to judge souls. Another of Jesus' clearest teachings about hell is found in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus describes the rich man as being in the place of torment after his death, a place of eternal suffering, while Lazarus, the poor man, is comforted in Abraham's bosom. In addition to these examples, Jesus also speaks about hell in other passages. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, he warns, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment, and whosoever shall say, Thou fool unto his brother, shall be guilty before the council, and whosoever shall say unto him, Fatuous, shall be liable to hell fire. This teaching reinforces the seriousness of our words and attitudes towards others, linking them to the eternal consequences of our actions. Hell is a real place and not something symbolic. Number 15. Jesus was created by God. A mistaken belief that has been promoted by some groups is that Jesus is not eternal, but was created by God at some point in time. According to this interpretation, Jesus would be a creature like any other, a being that began to exist at some point in history, and not an eternal divine being. This error is at odds with the central teaching of the Christian Church on the nature of Christ and His relationship to God. Scripture makes it clear that Jesus was not created, but is eternal and has always existed as part of the Trinity. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, the Apostle states unequivocally, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse is fundamental to understanding the divine nature of Jesus. The word, in Greek logos, refers to Jesus, who already existed in the beginning. 
that is, since before the creation of the world. He was not created, but has always existed in perfect unity with God the Father. Furthermore, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it is explained that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, referring to the incarnation of Jesus in the human person of Jesus of Nazareth. This underlines that Jesus, as the eternal Word, is God Himself who became human to dwell among men. This concept of Jesus' eternity is essential to Christian doctrine, since it implies that He is not just a prophet or a created figure, but is God Himself, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the biblical teaching is clear. Jesus was not created. He is eternal, coexistent with God the Father since before the foundation of the world. To attribute to Jesus a created origin is a serious theological error that denies his divinity and his central role in the creation and redemption of the world. Dear listeners, as we have seen throughout history, there have always been people or groups that distort the true personality of Jesus, presenting a false Jesus that has no basis in the Bible. This is why we must always be alert and vigilant, denouncing the heresies that are spread and boldly proclaiming the true word of God. It is essential that as Christians we hold firm to our convictions in the truth revealed in the scriptures. We know that Jesus is God who heals, saves, baptizes with power, and will soon return in glory to redeem his people. This is the truth that we must share and live with the certainty that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we come to the end of this video. Thank you for being part of our channel. God bless you abundantly. Until the next video.